Hey guys, this is Stowe Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I wanted to let you know about an exciting event we have coming up on September 23rd in Nashville, Tennessee. One of Ron Paul's favorite lines was, truth is treason and the empire of lies. Americans around the country are waking up to this reality, war across the globe, regulating free speech at home, printing trillions of dollars. The regime accepts no limits to its power. Speaking on this topic, we all have brave truth tellers, including Ted Carpenter, Michael Rechtenwald, Jonathan Newman, and many more. Again, this is on September 23rd in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. You can find more about this event and get your tickets at Mises.org slash Nashville 23. Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor with the Mises Institute. And of course, with me is Tho Bishop, my co-host here on Radio Rothbard. And Tho, we're going to talk a little bit today about political crime and how political crime becomes more prominent as regime paranoia increases. And by regime paranoia, I mean all this stuff you're hearing from our current regime, but of course this is a common phenomenon among governments. You're hearing a lot about insurrection, about misinformation, about people undermining uh, elections. How dare people question the outcomes of elections? And there just seems to be a heightened uh, fear on the part of the regime about all of these people out there who are saying bad things about the regime and doubting the regime's elections and its institutions. And to a certain extent, we have documented evidence that they're not completely off base. In recent years, public faith in uh, government institutions has gone into even steeper decline than normal. I think uh, a recent Gallup poll showed about 6% of registered Republicans uh, view, say that they have either moderate or a lot of faith in the presidency, uh, and only 18% of independents. So <laughs> one in five Americans who aren't Democrats think that the presidency uh, is something that requires your faith. Of course, it's all, the, the Congress is despised. Even the Supreme Court has gone into deep decline. The police have suffered. Even the military has seen double-digit declines in how much people place their faith and, uh, and in this institution and how much integrity they think this institution has. And normally the, the military has been untouchable. And so certainly there's something going on where people are starting to figure out that these uh, institutions are corrupt and certainly don't have uh, your best uh, interests at heart. And so what does that mean then? Well, we often find that when, the, when states start to suspect that the public uh, is doubting its legitimacy or when the state encounters um, big problems in terms of its military successes or its ability to rule, they start to crack down then. They start talking more and more about dissidents and about um, doing something about all of these people that oppose the regime. And I think that's why we hear more and more about misinformation, about the need to control the flow of information, about how there's all these people out there lying about the regime. And we know that the Biden administration is actively involved in getting private corporations to uh, deplatform people, to control what they say. I wouldn't really call it censorship because it's not direct control and, and judicial prosecution as it is historically, but it's certainly government attempts to get around the First Amendment and silence its critics. And if the state felt that most people were fine with the regime, I don't think you'd see that sort of thing happening, uh, let alone all of these draconian uh, sentences being handed down to the January 6th defendants where you've got people, and I noted this in an article that we published Friday, which is on this irony of how real crime is surging in the nation, unsolved mystery, unsolved uh, crime, or unsolved murders at a 30-year high, 
uh, high increases in both property and violent crime. Yeah, not back to 1970s or early 90s rates, but certainly significant increases of 30% year over year in some cases. While that's going on, instead, what we're seeing is the FBI pulling out all the stops to, uh, to find everyone they can who might have been associated with January 6th or other quote-unquote crimes uh, against the regime. And so you have people handed years in prison for putting their feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk or for walking through her office. That uh, the, the head of the Proud Boys, hand, or their currently prosecutors are seeking a 30-year sentence for this guy who wasn't even in Washington on January 6th. And meanwhile, of course, uh, the FBI, <laughs> the FBI is uh, blithely casual about real crimes, sexual assaults, which uh, I document in the article as well. Clearly, their primary interest is protecting the regime, and political crime just seems to be their primary concern. So I, I think we're seeing that more and more, and and certainly they're. Uh, directing most of it toward this idea of that there's all these right-wing operatives out there that are trying to undermine the regime, and they're engaged in quote-unquote anti-democratic activities, which in an early article I noted is just the modern stock pra- phrase for what the, the Soviets used to call anti-revolutionary uh, activities. Regimes come up with these phrases where it sounds like it's uh, it's against some sort of uh, value that everybody loves and values, when really all it means is anti-regime activity. So when you hear anti-democratic, all it means is anti-government, anti-regime. When you In the Soviet Union or in Cuba, when you heard anti-revolutionary, all that mean, meant was something the regime doesn't like. So my impression is that there's an increase in this sort of regime hysteria, regime paranoia over all of these topics. Uh, but maybe that's just my impression and you talking to the normies out in the real world that maybe there's just as much faith in the regime as ever. Uh, but I would suggest that some of the documentation gives the regime good reason for being a little bit more paranoid than usual. Right. If, if uh, people in D.C. were talking to the people I interact with on a daily basis, they would have good reason to be paranoid. And I really like that, that term that you've, you're pushing there, regime paranoia as creating the specter. And I think it's important to put this kind of within a broader context because some of these dynamics that we're talking about are kind of built into the system, right? These are kind of within the structure of state placing. Um, You know, one of my favorite articles of yours in the past, the classic McMakin banger, was um, highlighting, this was 2019, highlighting that fewer than half of violent crimes are solved in America. So this is before the craziness of 2020, you know, the, the summer of love that we saw then. You know, this is something that has been baked into the pie in terms of the priorities that various police institutions have in terms of focusing on high revenue generating crimes, offenses, civil asset forfeiture, drug crimes, et cetera, et cetera, that you know, just the very basic economics of state controlled policing. Um, Dr. Tate Fegley gave a talk about this at Mises U. If anyone's interested in that topic, I'd recommend looking at his lecture and his work broadly on this, that you know, we don't have a, an incentive structure for policing, that market for defense, that really prioritize or can prioritize violent crime given the structure. But what we've seen the last few years is, you know, back in, back in 2019, right, we, we, didn't, we weren't arresting a bunch of, you know, burglars and uh, uh, violent criminals, and then releasing them back on the streets for political reasons, right? And we saw that play out during, um, you know, the, the, the riots in, inspired by the George Floyd uh, case. We, we, we've seen this in recent years where there is this, this anarcho-tyrannical dynamic to it where certain people of a political bent have a very low level, a very low threshold in terms of what the police are willing to do. We can go into factors in terms of you know, the explicit politicalization of uh, uh, you know, DAs and the like. Um, you know, I, I think everyone kind of feels this, this gradual partisan dynamic within the criminal justice, and it's only been amplified after January 6th, which was kind of the perfect situation to help allow for this, this aggressive escalation on this anti-regime behavior on the oppositional class that has been used ever since. And you, you look at something right now, again, we, I think one of the, the, the themes that we talk about that is, is very important is the continual erosion of certain norms, right? You know, there's always been, again, 
So long as we have a state, there's going to be various inefficiencies, there's various incentives, incentive problems, and that ultimately what really governs a political body, what really governs a state, is less the Constitution, it's less anything written down in law, it is kind of accepted upon code of norms, which, you know, inevitably in a time of crisis tend to be broken. Um, often those changes are not healed afterwards. We have this ratchet effect in terms of how the state operates. And what we're seeing right now, I think particularly with, say, the um, charges levied against Trump in Georgia, the important part of that is less the charges against Trump, which you know we're probably all tired of uh, tired of talking about. It's a continuation of very a variety of these indictments. It's a continuation of this larger regime versus Trump sort of narrative out there. But the escalation there is the willing to prosecute his legal team. It's the willingness to prosecute the chief of staff. It's all these different individuals that were serving in a sort of professional role. Um, for what their client, Donald Trump, was wanting to do. And that focus on going after them is something that is highly, highly irregular. Um, and it can, can continues this escalation of the breakdown of accepted norms within this going after, again, reflecting, I think, this regime paranoia that you have right now. And that, you know, the, 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 you, know you talked about the decaying faith in institutions, you know, going back to the military polling, um, one of the things that's most interesting is that the, the group of Americans right now that are the least um, optimistic, the least uh, uh, have the least amount of confidence in the military is that independent voter. Um, and so you, you see kind of the, particularly this, this line of independence, their faith, um, which you would expect, right? You know, Republicans, Democrats, right? Okay, you have a Republican in the White House, Democrats are gonna respond to that. Republicans in the White House, Democrats are gonna respond to that, fine, whatever. You're gonna have that sort of binary dynamic. It's that independent voter that is losing all of this faith, no matter who is in charge, that again, I think is reflecting this, this just general breakdown on who can you trust within the regime. And again, that, that, that creates the opportunities for, you know, for, for, for those of us that, that see the regime for what it is, um, you know, should that be, be able to be focused into you know, some sort of toppling, some sort of reform, however you want to, you know, whatever the end result is. But it, it, it does reflect in just this mass understanding that what is going on right now is not normal, it's not okay, and you know, the regime is doing it, doubling down on protecting itself and all of its own special interests, while again, the, the crime rates in inner cities, um, and, and really beyond that, is, is going up. And it's, it's, of course, it's, it's difficult to get accurate measures on this. We've talked about in the past, the, the reporting of various crime statistics from the FBI and the like, the most uh, recent data from the FBI goes back to 2019 before we saw this uptick. Um, and so there's also that sort of cover-up dynamic as well, if you were to take a cynical aspect, and you know, dare I say we might be cynical on some of the reporting of these federal agencies, um, but there's also that, that move to hide exactly how bad things are going, and so you have various media outlets trying to say, try to convince people, oh, well, everything's hunky-dory, your average person is not feeling that right now. Yeah, I think they uh, they have. It's not just the news. Uh, normal people, I think, they can just look around their city and just see how much disorder there is in terms of homeless camps. Uh, and some cities are certainly worse than others. I, it's it's silly. Foreigners like to do this a lot. Oh, I visited San Francisco, and I can't believe America is so dirty and awful now. Yeah, well. <laughs> San Francisco is a long way from me. So uh, trying to uh, describe America, quote unquote, according to the filth of places like California uh, is perhaps going a bit far. But I think when you can see uh, just the, the general urban disorder that exists, that's alarming to people. And they don't like living in filthy cities where they're constantly accosted. Uh, by homeless people, and they don't know what those people will do. Um, it's it's not pleasant, and they wonder why they have to live this way, and they wonder why, while all that is going on, the regime seems primarily concerned with controlling quote-unquote misinformation, uh, where, God forbid, somebody might criticize Pfizer Corporation online. And I, I think people get a sense of that's where the real priorities of the regime lie. Now, we should note, of course, historically, that this is hardly... Like the, the the first time this has happened, right? American history is filled with these panics over 
some sort of uh, enemy group that is trying to undermine the regime. Right now, it just happens to be Trump supporters or people who are sympathetic to that at all, or people who didn't want to take the vaccine, or people who maybe think that uh, that counts in elections are not 100% accurate, which of course is the realistic view. And so we can look, of course, about various panics during World War I, uh, the Alien Sedition Acts uh, in the 1790s, and, of course, the Cold War was a great uh, flowering of paranoia over uh, foreign agents and communists and all of that, all of which, of course, greatly uh, increased the power of the state. Or we recently passed the uh, the 31st anniversary of the Ruby Ridge double murder committed by federal agents uh, of innocent people at the uh, the Randy Weaver compound in northern Idaho, uh, for which no federal agents were punished, of course. But this was clearly a case where it was just regime paranoia over Randy Weaver. Oh, he had some guns that we decided were illegal. The guy hardly had any sort of arsenal that was a threat to the public at large. Uh, and they 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 uh, they spend countless hours and resources trying to get this guy, and then set up uh, an entire um, operation around his house in the middle of nowhere, and killed him, and tried to convince him of various crimes uh, on which uh, they didn't get him uh, for much at all. And so there you go. There's just a, the, the 1990s hysteria over militias and, and right wing Aryan nation people and that sort of thing, which, of course, proved to be no threat to the general public whatsoever. Um, and so we can find many, many cases of this. Uh, but perhaps the golden age of uh, the retreat of the state in terms of this sort of thing was in the 19th century after Jefferson's victory in 1800, and they got rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts and just really scaled back um, the Federalist attempts to clamp down on freedom uh, across the nation so that throughout uh, certainly the first half of the 19th century, you had uh, no federal laws about sedition or conspiracy or any of that stuff. Anyone who was convicted of treason was convicted of doing it against the state, and that, of course, was extremely rare. And the only paranoia you really had was actually in the slave states where there was constant paranoia over slave insurrections and uh, abolitionists who were sending flyers and stuff in the mail to uh, uh, encourage anti-slavery activities and stuff. In most of the country, their, their political crime just simply wasn't an issue at all. It was after the Civil War then that the regime started to introduce all of these made-up crimes like seditious conspiracy and all of these acts you might engage in that counted as uh, a lesser version of treason. The reason they couldn't uh, expand treason was because treason is so clearly defined uh, in the Constitution precisely for purposes of limiting state power. They, they knew that monarchs of old had defined treason any way they wanted, and this was a way to screw people over, and so they carefully defined uh, treason very specifically. So what did the feds do? They invented a bunch of crimes uh, around sedition and insurrection and that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, let's not Let's not get nostalgic or think that this isn't something that regularly occurs. It occurs in all states, and it certainly occurs in the United States as well. It is restrained somewhat by the Bill of Rights, however. And so, of course, you can be sure that if, they, if it could, the regime would outlaw, quote-unquote, misinformation, that they would imprison people for criticizing vaccines uh, online if they could or on the news. They can't because... Uh, constitutional jurisprudence, to the extent that still holds up, is in the way. So uh, if they could overturn that tomorrow, they absolutely would. That I, I have no doubt that this is a long-term goal that they would like to have. And uh, censorship is very much on real censorship with that comes with criminal penalties is very much, I think, a goal uh, of regime backers. And uh, you saw how the right wing works with this uh, 20 years ago during the uh, the panic over terrorism and that people, anyone who uh, spoke out against the regime's illegal wars was said to be for the terrorist. That was the official line from Cheney and Friends, uh, Cheney the Elder. And uh, so it's certainly not a, a partisan thing in that it applies to any one party. It tends to just be worse with whoever happens to be uh, in power 
at any given time. But of course, my overall position on this is that political crime isn't a real crime at all, uh, including treason. We've, of course, quoted Lysand Lysander Spooner more than once on that. Um, you can't be convicted of treason for some sort of document you never signed, for you had no part in creating this fake social contract that only upholds your end of it, by the way. You have to pay taxes. You have to submit to it at all times. If the state just lets your children be murdered in a school um, or makes good on the fact that uh, it is known that police do not have to actually provide you protection, if they just ignore you, if they just don't keep up their end of that keeping you safe bargain, it's fine. You just have to keep paying for it. It's a one-sided social contract and thus not a contract at all. And <clears throat> so any attempt to uh, claim that uh, people who don't uphold this social contract or don't hold to it are guilty of some sort of betrayal, treason, uh, sedition, that sort of thing, it's all nonsense. If people are engaging in violent activities, they should be convicted of those violent activities. If they shot someone who did not attempt to attack them at the Capitol, then they're guilty of assault or attempted murder or even murder. Um, but they, the whole purpose of these political crimes is for the regime to add additional penalties uh, and to make it easier to get convictions. This is historically the role of political crime and to make it worse for the defendant. And uh, certainly we're seeing that now with January 6th, but we've also seen it with all of the spying that takes place around terrorism and now domestic terrorism. And it's all these are all attempts to get around uh, the established law and create special tribunals or more uh, less attention to the needs of evidence and to whip up public furor over this supposed threat to the public that occurs with these uh, these so-called political crimes. And, and it's all attempts to really build the power of the regime. And so anytime you see anyone being accused of one of these political crimes, you should ask, why are they being charged for this fake crime and not for some sort of real theft or real type of assault that would be considered crime in any other circumstance? It's just the fact that the government gets special treatment and any attack on government property is seen as some sort of special crime when reality, in reality it should not be. Of course, there's an economic dynamic to this as well, because we've seen as one of the ways that the regime has sought to actively subvert the Bill of Rights has been outsourcing their censorship, the, the tools of you know, controlling the conversation to large tech companies. And there is a very interesting um, Supreme Court case um, pending to be, be adjudicated there. Um, it's already had some wins. Uh, it's Missouri versus Biden, where the Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt um, has filed lawsuits against the Biden administration. This is kind of in the aftermath of the Twitter files. And what you have there is a number of, of individuals whose content was censored at the direct um, you know, insistence of the regime, of the Biden administration. Um, and they, they, they're, they're working their way through that process. One of the people with, involved in that case was, is Dr. Aaron Cariotti, who spoke at our Medical Freedom Summit in New Hampshire um, this past week, and I highly recommend our listeners looking at his talk as well. It's a, it's a very great, um, it's, it's kind of a, a, almost a, a Rothbardian breakdown of, of um, sort of the, the major players, kind of the, the economic incentives into the, the biomedical security state. But we've seen the regime get utilizing these sort of proxy corporate entities, um, all of which, right, you know, they're, they're dependent upon the permission of, you know, permission being perhaps overly, um, uh, uh, you know, being a little bit of, of hyperbole there, but they, they ultimately, they, their, their entire role of business can be directly damaged by various government entity, entities and agencies should they not do the bidding of the regime. And I think this is where it separates a great deal from where we were at during the War on Terror days, where I remember you know, being able to go on YouTube and watch you know, loose change you know, promoting 9-11 as an inside job, right? You, you, could, you had access to all of this um, alternative information uh, undermining the, narr the various narratives of you know, the war on terror, of you know, what was going on with the Patriot Act, all these things. Um, you know, over time, the regime has adapted to that and has co-opted various platforms that once were allowed for genuine free speech and sort of dissident thought. They have now become kind of lockstep within the, the, the power structures that be. And you know, thinking back to kind of this history of regime paranoia and these political crimes, it's also worth recognizing that you know th there is a history in this country. Um, you know, if you think about the Reconstruction period after the Civil War, 
right, where, where the federal government went in and basically destroyed existing political structures by the states. You know, you, you had uh, carpetbaggers moving into southern states to do the, the bidding of the Republican Party during the Grant administration. You had scallywags who were, you know, Republican opportunists within these southern states that were perfectly fine taking up the mantle of the federal government. You had massive um, restriction on the vote for southerners who were against the, you know, the, the, the Union um, during the Civil War. You saw massive expansion of the franchise for various voting groups that the regime that the, the the union saw would vote reliably Republican. And so you had you know very much this entire dynamic of an imposed political structure on these, you know, states that had, you know, fought against the country. Um, and it also played out within broader political conversations. You had the the waving of the red shirt of the bloody shirt um, being evoked. You write this entire sense of of treason, this entire sense of uh, you know lack of loyalty to the government was regularly used as a political hammer going against anyone that spoke up against you know what was a very corrupt, um, a, a, an objectively corrupt uh, Republican government during the Grant administration. So these dynamics, these these are not alien to the United States. I mean, I get that you know I understand that you're talking about the 1870s. You might as well be talking about the you know 1070s. Um, for many people, but there is, even within the, the general constitutional framework that America's had, we've seen this play out on American soil. And while we haven't gotten quite to the part, to the point of having, you know, various military uh, districts governing red states that are refusing to bend the knee to whatever Washington wants, um, when we think about, again, this gradual breakdown of political norms, when we think about um, moves right now to ban um, Trump from the ballot, in certain states. Now, obviously, most of these are going to be in you know, places like California, where you know the chance of Trump winning there generally, you know, isn't, isn't very relevant. And so, you know, from a practical standpoint, you know, th that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have a, a major electoral impact in terms of national politics. But you can think about states like Arizona, where you have a Democrat regime there. You can think about places like Wisconsin and Michigan. You take a few of those states off the board entirely by using the label of insurrection to remove certain candidates that they don't want on the, the ballot in the general election. And immediately you have you know, political disenfranchisement in this country on the scale of which we haven't seen in a very, very long time. And again, all this comes back to this underlying culture, this underlying fear of what DC has right now, which again, it's, it's a very paranoid regime. And as we've talked about in the past, paranoid regimes are the most dangerous regimes. These are the ones that are, are far more likely to, to act out. They are far more, you know, th that, that threat to their power structure. Um, leads to you know, aggressiveness, it leads to recklessness. Stable regimes are a lot, you know, for, for all the sins that they will commit, and that, 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 you know, that is many, um, they are far more likely to allow certain things to play out, um, being confident in the, you know, kind of the feet they have on, underneath them. And I think right now, um, you know, when you see just the absurdity of what's going on, you know, when, when you have Biden falling asleep in, you know, Maui, um, you know, during a, an event honoring, um, you know, children, I mean, again, a thousand plus children that have likely perished in a fire there, which itself, you know, we, we talk about the, the inability for the regime to provide stability, as our own Connor O'Keefe wrote an article last week on the Mises Wire. I mean, the number of state failings, you know, whether it go, goes to um, you know, water supplies for putting out the fire when it comes to the lack of alarm systems that are there on the island that were not used. You know, the regime is so focused on chasing these political crimes where there's so many day-to-day you know, -day basic security order, you know, you know, those sort of services that you would expect to be carried out even by a bad government. Um, those things are completely falling by the wayside with the obsession over these overtly ideological, political, you know, dominating sort of agendas out there. And again, I, th I think this is something that Americans are, are recognizing um, but the question is, you know, what does it actually look at, like in practice to push back again, particularly as you have various entities that get raked through the coals by the existing power structure, um, you know, when they are effective at standing up against it? Yeah, that's a good point, right, is that when, when, when regimes are afraid, they tend to act out. Uh, certainly, historically, this is, this is abundantly clear that it's when uh, states start to see that the wheels are coming off. That's when comes down uh, all of the prosecutions for treason and undermining the regime. And many people have pointed out that it was after 1942 for the Nazi regime, after they started to lose 
uh, in the war that that's when all of the most draconian sentences started coming down against any sort of German dissident. Uh, these were ordinary Germans who suddenly found themselves caught up uh, in uh, in the net, the uh, the Third Reich net, simply for expressing some opposition to the regime. And that, that wouldn't have happened in 1935. But once things started to go badly for the regime, it became certainly something that uh, became downright common. And in, in those sorts of cases, then prisoners start to get treated uh, more badly, um, con more concentration camps, prison camps get opened, not just in the Third Reich, but in all, all these sorts of regimes. And uh, cert uh, thankfully, that's not quite uh, as much of an issue uh, in the United States. But nevertheless, I think there is an upside to that, of course, is that, well, if as long as the regime's uh, paranoia is founded on real developments, as we've suggested it probably is, that does suggest a real lot lack of faith in the regime, which is, of course, dangerous uh, in terms of setting yourself up to reprisals from the regime itself, but is good and a a uh, beneficial development in terms of ideological trends because you want people to lose their faith in the regime and to start to see how little it offers in exchange for its crippling taxes and regulations and nonstop propaganda and all of the demands it makes on regular people that when a bridge collapses in uh, middle America, oh, it's going to be a few years before we can replace that bridge. Oh, but by the way, we'll make sure that men can use women's bathrooms because that's our real priority. And so there, of course, <laughs> the, there's outcries over those sorts of things and which forces the state to backpedal. And that's all to the good, but that makes people in Washington very uncomfortable because they don't like being criticized. They don't like people making them do things they don't feel like doing. And, uh, and consider, for example, these laws saying that, oh, members of Congress can no longer invest in stocks actively. Uh, these are exactly the sorts of good legislation you get from real losses of confidence in the regime. The fact that that hasn't been illegal for 100 years is really quite shocking, actually, um, but just shows how naive most Americans have been about uh, regime power and its legitimacy. And so, especially among conservatives who have traditionally been among uh, the first to proclaim their support for the regime and wave its flag, I think that's all to the best. I think they should take a step further and stop using the regime's language in terms of things like uh, treason and betraying public order and law and order and that sort of thing. The government's law is, I mean, <laughs> some of those laws are legit laws, but many of them are garbage and don't deserve your respect or any sort of praise for their enforcement. And I think we're starting to see how law, especially during COVID, is used against innocent people, shutting down business, sending out the police to destroy your life because you wouldn't uh, close your business down or you left your house. And I think a lot of people saw that and will now remember it. And that has greatly harmed, I think, their views of regime legitimacy. But stop using words like treason and uh, the and you know just follow the law, comply, which have long been conservative mottos and rally cries. Uh, he should have just said what the police did. Really, should those have been, so those people who had the cops shut down their businesses during COVID should they have just complied? Should they have just done what the police did? And it's it's refreshing and good to see that many conservatives who traditionally have been stooges for the regime on this issue, useful idiots who could always be counted on uh, to support uh, regime and its and its concepts of law, are now starting to turn the page on that. So. Uh, I would encourage those people who are starting to have their doubts to very much consider uh, continuing to do so and to finally make that jump into recognizing uh, just how arbitrary most of these laws are and that the idea of that political crime, that is crimes against the regime are somehow worse than crimes against normal people, that that's all nonsense and should, uh, should cease to have any sort of respect in, in the minds of ordinary people at all. It should also be rejected this entire notion of complete impotency in response to this, right? Like what you get right now is a bunch of, you, know, you, you get a handful of congressmen that, that you know, go in front of hearings and they yell at certain figures, and rightfully so. And I, I think a lot of the ones that actually do that are, are much better on this issue than the majority of their peers. But the reality is, is that the Republicans have a majority of the, the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives controls the budget. 
And so rather than simply talking about the weaponization of the government, having hearings and you know, doing all these sort of things, which again, it's better than doing nothing at all. You know, I'll, I'll take the, the show over doing nothing, that's fine. Um, but if you're really convinced that the FBI is being weaponized against your voters, which you should be, right? If, if, if you don't have that, that's another problem that you should, you should not be in office, but you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see how voters respond to that. But if you have that position, then the answer is to defund the FBI. The answer is to defund these various entities that are working against the interests of your constituency base. And until you have you know, a Republican you know, a, 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 a Republican party, in this case, just given the current dynamics here, but you know, whenever the, 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 the party that is at the greatest risk of persecution by the standing authorities, or as long as they're willing to continue to rubber stamp budgets and to huff and puff and then eventually give in when push comes to shove and are willing to, to stand and take you know, might, what might be short-term politically unpopular views to get serious about funding the very mechanisms that are being used against your people, then we're going to have this continue. One side has no problem right now doing all sorts of heinous things, breaking all sorts of norms um, in order to achieve their ideological goals. If the other side refuses to play that game, if, they're, if, if, if they were refusing to use the leverage that they have, but the state level, federal level, et cetera, whenever you have a foothold of political power, if you're not willing to be, to, to rise up to the, to, to the time and to use whatever leverage you have to stop these things, to protect the people that you are supposed to represent in theory, um, then we're going to continue to see this continual one-sided slide um, towards a, you know, effectively a, a national party um, dictating and, and, you know, the punishment of their enemies and the awarding of their friends. And, you know, there, there's, there's been a shift within the rhetoric. You've seen various um, entities that make up the more intellectual side of uh, conservatism or whatever word you want to use to call it, um, identify some of the sort of stuff. But until that's followed through with action, um, and, until you have political leaders that are willing to to do this, then one side is going to continue to to roll over on. It's, it's going to continue to to tread on the other half of the country that that is very much upset and concerned about what is going on right now. Um, and again, this goes to your point earlier about how democracy. You know, any, any words about democracy, you're simply a defending regime. And when you have now it becoming a, a, a you know the concern is the actual holding of elections. Um, you know, for, for, for the political process. I can't think of anything that makes more blatant these, uh, you know, just, just how, how shallow this views of democracy really are. Um, and of course, you've been writing about, you know, just the, the way that the term democracy can be used as, uh, you know, whatever catch-all you want it to be for a very long time. Um, but again, hopefully there's more Americans waking up to that very reality. And so, you know, whatever you learned watching Schoolhouse Rock in the in the 80s um, no longer applies to the way that the structures of power really exist in, in our utilize here in the United States of America in 2023. Right. Well, we'll go ahead and end on that for this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thank you, though, for joining me. And we will be back next week with a- another episode. And we'll see you next time.